From his extensive early stage career in numerous productions for the Royal Shakespeare Company to his iconic Hollywood roles as Star Trek's Captain Jean-Luc Picard and Professor Charles Xavier in the X-Men movies to his current work for stage, film, and TV, Sir Patrick Stewart continues to dare to go where few actors have gone before. Hello, I'm Paula Zahn, and in the words of Lady Macbeth, what's done may be done. But I was fortunate to talk with Sir Patrick and discuss the great performances production of Macbeth and hear some of his thoughts on the production's journey from the stage to screen. Sir Patrick Stewart, it is an honor to have you join us. Oh, thank you, Paul. I'm delighted to be here. This is a very contemporary interpretation of Shakespeare. And I have to say, it is very shocking at times in a, in a visual sense and, and emotionally. And I was curious if, if it was that contemporary interpretation that drew you to the production in the first place. It was the role that drew me to the production. It, you know, if you're at all a serious classical actor, a Shakespearean actor, there are certain roles that you have to pencil in for the future. And Macbeth was one of them, but I, I thought too much time had passed because there has been a fashion current the last 15, 20 years of casting the Macbeths younger and younger, and I had begun to think that I was now too long in the tooth for the role. But I had just worked with Rupert Gould, our director, on a, a, a most unusual production of The Tempest, and uh, working with him had been such a treat. He has... Um, uh, it might be almost like a, a split vision of seeing something um, either profoundly in focus or ever so slightly out of focus, which shifts the, the content of the material. I'll give you an instance. Um, there's a very long scene in the middle of the play, w which is known as the murderous scene. It's when Macbeth corrupts two men into killing Banquo and Banquo's child. It, it, it's a savage and dark and unsettling scene, but it's long and there's a lot of exposition. And one day in rehearsals, I said, Rupert, I, oh, we stand here and we talk, 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 talk. I wish I had an action, something, something. And he said, why don't you make a sandwich? This idea of taking something everyday, commonplace, uh, uh, absurdly incongruous, like buttering a slice of bread, putting on ham, and then sharing it with the murderers while the, the, the main objective of the scene being to corrupt them, um, seemed to give an added horror to what was happening. This was a classic example of uh, how Rupert can perceive a traditional scene and just put a little twist on it. Oh yeah, it betrayed such a coldness and, and such a sense of depravity. Yes. Yes, and that's what you wanted, isn't it? Well, um, it was necessary to emerge, both of us, Kate, myself, all the, the whole company, into this violent, cruel, uh, and completely psychotic world. All hail Macbeth. Thou shalt be king hereafter. The approach we took to the play was one in which I began in a quite a muted manner. A little introspective, insecure, uncertain of what he really wanted, delighted to be promoted by the king. And because we haven't talked about this, the wife who was generations younger and hungry for the absolute power for the ultimate power and and it had always been my conception that Macbeth should be enthralled by her so was it your idea to cast Lady Macbeth generations it, this was the you? one concept that I took to Rupert at the very beginning yeah it would just yeah. so happen he happened to be married the, to the gorgeous woman that would later become Lady Macbeth uh, was that at all strange yes. she's extraordinary in this film. <sighs> First of all, I have to say that she is one of the most delightful people, uh, actresses I've ever known, and we became 
the greatest of friends. I mean, true buddies during the life of that production, and we still are. But when I was on stage with her, there were times when she scared me witless. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. Her re-entrance after she has gone back to the murder scene was something that in a year, over a year, I, I never got used to. Come, fate, into the list. Champion me to the utterance. For me, there was a significant turning point in the play when Macbeth decides to embrace uh, the darkness totally and not to look back and no longer to have a conscience, to banish his conscience. But someone has said that his problem was that he had too much imagination. And, and that's what finally unseats him. He cannot be ultimately a truly possessed, psychotic, um, lost individual. Because even towards the end of the play, there are little murmurs of remorse, little murmurs of what he has done, and it never, ever quite leaves him. So, in other words, it makes him human. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. What did it mean to you when Ian McKellen told you during the Tomorrow and Tomorrow soliloquy you should think about the word and? Uh, is that true that that happened? It, it, it is true. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how it happened. Um, I had had to pay a visit to the, the, the Royal Shakespeare Company rehearsal room in Clapham in South London. And it just so happened that Trevor Nunn was directing Ian McKellen in Lear. They were in rehearsal and uh, Ian had gone missing. I went into the rehearsal room and they said, we've lost him. We're in the middle of a run through and he's disappeared. So I was on the sidewalk outside when I saw in the distance coming up the street, Sir Ian <laughs> munching away on, on a piece of cake that he'd been out and bought. And, uh, and so we, we talked about the Lear, and uh, he said, oh, if, if I may, can I, one thing about, because he, of course, is a famous Macbeth. And he said, well, just one thing, if I may. And I said, yeah, what, what is it? Feeling a little bit defensive. And he said, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, the important word is and. And it was like a light went off in my head, because I got it instantly, instantly, even though we hadn't even started rehearsing. Give me an example of what he meant. Uh, well, uh, conventionally, you might think of that line as being tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. What Ian was suggesting, that it might read tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And then you get the sense of weight of time and the relentless nature of time and it's never going to stop and every day will be awful, awful. And um, it, it was thrilling. So every single night when we got to that, there was a little quiet. Thank you, Sir Ian, for that one there. I'm curious if you ended up calibrating your film performance any differently than what you did on stage. Um, calibrating, yes. And perhaps it is about calibrating most of all. Um, because you're not having to communicate a complex thought or a complex idea or, or a phrase, um, you know, across 25 rows. Uh, it can be done very, very intimately. Oh, and it's, it's so intensely personal because you're looking straight into that close-up lens. Yeah. And I imagine that everybody watching the film adaptation would feel like I did. He's talking to me. I hope so. I hope so. It, it, th the early experience of rehearsing and performing the play, I think, had very much prepared us for being in front of a camera. And what actors have now for decades discovered is that Shakespeare was a screenwriter. Uh, his, his language, his imagery, his verse, but most importantly, his characters translate 
into images that close. And because there is such truthfulness, uh, such profound reality in the way that he creates these characters, that there is no sense of strain about being in front of a camera. On the contrary, you know, you can, if, if, if stage acting is about action and film acting is about thinking, what better playwright than Shakespeare to have thoughts photographed? Well, I can't tell you what a pleasure it has been. Thank you, Paul. I really enjoyed it.